Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello. 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 Hi, everybody. Welcome. Glad that you're here today. Thanks. Um, we'll uh, go ahead and get started understanding that there will be people that may need to be sliding in where you are. So just being patient with that and working as a team. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so I feel like it's been a long time since we were together um, because of the snow day. Uh, so I hope that you were able to use your power of choice and do things that, that were the right things for you on that day. Um, it was a welcome gift in my house, and so I hope it was for you as well. So I'd like to go back to that moment, the, or that last class, last Monday, the power of choice. Um, as we think about that idea of using all of our equipment um, as we come into the beginning of this class. So our equipment, you're going to hear me use that phrase a whole lot over the course of the semester. So thinking about all of our equipment, our heads and our hearts and our guts, um, those parts that actually make up, make up the core of our being. You know, they aren't these extraneous parts that are out here, but the things that are all in physical alignment when we sit, when we stand, even when we lay down, those things are aligned. Um, so thinking about how that, that center, that core of us keeps us balanced, keeps us centered, keeps us aligned, keeps us energized, keeps us feeling whole when we are using all of our equipment. So, so let's take a moment and just sort of center ourselves as usual, beginning with our heads. So make a check what's happening in your head right now. What's happening there? We t used the analogy of the water. When the water was all shaken up, then uh, we were, you know, we can be like that, all shaken up, but then we can use the power to settle ourselves um, as the water settles. So settle your racing thoughts, or if you're feeling sluggish in your mind, then you might want to send a little bit of extra energy up there to your heads. Give your mind a gentle nudge to wake things up up there, being fully present. And then tuning into our hearts, moving on down through that core, moving to our hearts. What's happening in that precious part of you? Take a couple of good deep breaths, expanding your rib cage, focusing on the heart. Is there peace or excitement or heartache? Tune into your heart for a moment and just be attentive as you breathe. And then down to your gut, that beautiful soulful place that helps us where we feel so deeply we can feel so deeply, or it might be that you don't recognize what's going on down there if you're out of touch, what your gut is telling you. Can you arrest, rest your attention there in your gut? What's happening in that deepest part of your core? So once we feel that alignment, right up and down, that centered feeling, that balance, then we can move forward with being completely ourselves. So I hope that you can bring your full self to these moments that we have together today. So we will begin our Baisai Film Fest. The extra credit movies begin this week. 
Um, Wednesday, February 1st, will be the first movie in 205 Ferguson. Jot that down in your notebook if you're interested. And in order to get the one point of extra credit for this movie, uh, you need to be on time. You sign in with Elsie Maddie. She'll be the one there directing that experience for you. You stay and watch the movie, and you just join the discussion afterward. Um, then you write a reflection on page 148 and hand the reflection into your TA with your journal that week. So yes, I'm sure that many of you, most of you, potentially all of you, have seen the movie Moana. But it's quite possible, in fact I doubt, that you've looked at it through the lens of Bai Sai 3. The themes that carry through this course are somewhat beautifully illustrated in this movie. And so even if you've seen it, come and hang out with Maddie, watch it, and then have those discussions. What, what's going on? What themes do you see that might be new? Open your eyes to something new in something familiar. Uh, so that's a good opportunity coming up this week, Wednesday, February 1st. There's also, in your week four part of your journal, there is this extra credit opportunity, also worth a point, um, to resolve a nature mystery. So taking a photo or making a sketch of something that attracts your attention and leads you to ask some kind of question. And then research until you find the answer to your question. So that could be, you know, using the old Google machine, could be going to the library, it could be having conversations with someone. Research could be a lot of different things. So this could be something that you see around campus, a tree that catches your interest. Um, it could be something that you observe happening between two people, a conversation that you might not fully understand. It could be just about anything that piques that science-y part of you that, uh, that you might have questions about. Then you attach the photo or sketch along with the explanation of your discovery. And that's due any time between now and April 16th. That's the day of our field trip. So you have a long time to find something to um, write about this. Um, so that is found in your week four section of your journal. There's this happening, um, Be the Change. You can learn about sustainable actions and careers from some alumni who are working out in the field. I was asked to announce this to you. Happening in February 6th from five o'clock to six o'clock in Hub 603. Um, so if you're curious about jobs and sustainability, there are some options or some possibilities of things um, that you could hear about from folks like these people. So that's an option for you. And the last announcement that I want to make is that to remind you that we can't be in two places at once. So no electronics uh, used in this class period. And if anything, you can use this as a break from your phone, a 50-minute break from your electronics. You don't have to respond to anybody. You have no obligations. Um, and so just spend this time with, with us together in this room. And if you're struggling to do that, then it might be an opportunity for you to analyze your relationship with your electronics and see, see what that's like for you. So it is, as outlined in the syllabus, your TA can take off points um, for participation if you are uh, using your electronics through this class. So now, let's dig in to what we've got today. I'd like to ask you this question. What's an example of a story that you told yourself today? A story that you told yourself today. So in this class, we, your TAs and I will often use this word story. And I want you to see, understand what that means in, in the Baisai realm. So story here is story equals a way of seeing that might create a belief for you or a truth for you. Um, so can anybody think of a story that you told yourself today? I'll give you an example. So my son Henry, who's 11, often says, Luke made me angry. 
but Luke can't make him anything. Luke is eight, his little brother, and and it's it's his story. It's Henry's story that he carries that Luke is making him angry. It comes out very forcefully, very dramatically in the 11-year-old world. Um, but Luke can't make him do anything because Henry is his own person. So that's a story. Henry is choosing to react that way. So how about you? Anybody have an example of a story that you told yourself today? <laughs> Because this morning was really gray, I was telling myself that I was sleepy, that I was sluggish, that I felt dreary because the weather was dreary. But really, that was my choice, right? I, I was choosing to feel sleepy and sluggish because gray days aren't my favorite. So once I realize that, I can perk myself up, I can feel better about it and just say, well, gray, gray days are temporary. This too is going to pass. How about the story of, I don't have time to eat breakfast? Did anyone use that one today? I don't have time to eat breakfast. Yeah, we all have the same amount of time. It's a matter of what you chose to do with it. So that might be a story. I have to do my homework. I ha I'm sorry, I can't go to yoga with you because I have to do my homework. Well, maybe you don't really want to make time for yoga, and so you can use homework as an excuse. But you don't have to do your homework. That's your choice. It's absolutely your choice whether you do your homework or not. You don't have to. You might want to. So these stories, in all of these cases, there are choices. And so I can be empowered if I understand that all of these things are under my control. So our stories affect us subconsciously in a lot of different ways. So we're going to be talking a lot about stories today. Earlier people had relationships with the natural world, a relationship of wonder with their universe, especially with phenomena that they could not rationally understand. So to solve these natural mysteries, they created a vast pantheon of gods and goddesses to explain anything that was beyond their understanding. Thunder, tides, earthquakes, volcanoes, of course now we understand the science of what's happening in those things, but um, for the early Greeks, you know, the ebb and flow of the ocean was attributed to the shifting moods of Poseidon because they didn't understand the pull of the moon and the earth and the relationship and the tides. And so the seasonal change to winter was caused by the planet's sadness because Persephone had been abducted into the underworld. Happened to her every year at the same time. And so winter came around. For the Romans, the volcanoes were said to be caused um, because of the home of Vulcan under the ground. Bla Vulcan was the blacksmith to the gods. He worked in a giant forge beneath the mountains, causing flames to spew out of the chimney, which now we know of as volcanoes and how that works. The ancients invented all of these to explain not only the mysteries of their planets, but the mysteries of themselves, their own beings. So in Greece, love was the result of being targeted by Eros, and epidemics were sent as punishment by Apollo. So when these ancient people experienced gaps in their understanding of the world around them, they filled those gaps with stories that they could understand and hold on to that helped them explain what's happening. So countless stories filled these countless gaps. And yet over the centuries, of course, our scientific knowledge increased. As the gaps in human understanding of the natural world disappeared, these stories 
Of course, now we don't believe in Vulcan or the power of Poseidon. So those stories had to shift. They had to go away. And so those shifts, though, I imagine that there were people that held on to those stories, saying, no, the Earth's crust isn't moving. That's not what causes volcanoes. And yet, of course, we know now, of course, that's what it is. It's not Vulcan. <laughs> So it takes time and it takes energy for these stories to shift. And sometimes it takes a lot of discomfort. And sometimes it takes a lot of work to shift those. And so those stories of, you know, I don't have time for breakfast or I have to do my homework might seem kind of absurd in this moment. And yet those are stories that you can shift if you really desire, if you really want to. So take a minute and just talk to your neighbor about this. What's coming up for you at this moment when we talk about stories in this kind of way, connected to our beliefs? with that a moment. Um, we're going to dig in a little bit deeper, maybe to other stories that have meaning for you. So this story, the Genesis creation story of both Christianity and Judaism, right? this story is created by humans that is said to be divinely inspired. So it's written by humans um, on behalf of, the, of God. So if this is your story, or if you have a different creation story that you've heard over the course of your life, consider for a moment how that story has shaped you and your beliefs and your actions. It's a big story. So when I looked up creation myth, myth is just another word for story, it has a different connotation in some, some ways, but when I looked up creation story on Wikipedia, there were many, many different cultures with many, many different creation stories. I found it to be interesting to consider the origins of these stories. How did they come to be? How did they come to be people's beliefs? Um, how did those beliefs then shape people's lives? This is Joan Chittister. She's a Benedictine nun. She's a native Pennsylvanian. She did her PhD at Penn State. She's been the global, the, excuse me, the co-chair for the Global Peace Initiative for Women. As the story goes, as she was making the choice to be a nun, she was 16 years old, she was listening to a guest speaker, somebody that was talking about the power of God and the creation story, and she asked, how do you know that God exists? How do you prove it? And the answer came back, you can't prove that it is true, but you can't prove that it's not true either. Belief is always a choice. So these things are very dramatically connected. Okay. So then there's this story, the Big Bang story, the science story of how we came to be here. The universe we see is only the vast tip of the, uh, the cosmic iceberg, right? It's vast. Hundreds of billions of galaxies, each of them home to billions of stars and planets and moon 
and all of the visible light and other energies, the x-rays and the radio waves and the gamma rays, everything we've ever seen with our telescopes is about 5% of all of the mass and the energy of the universe. Along with this normal matter, the things that we think of, you know, you learned that, that the characteristics of matter in science, in addition to this normal matter, there's also dark matter. It can't be seen, but it can be observed by its gravitational effect on the normal visible matter. It makes up another 27% of the universe's energy. It pulls galaxies together. But then, on the flip side, there's the other 68% of the energy of the universe is dark energy, and that's a force that's pus pushing the universe apart. So this really dramatic pull and push, and of course, there's more pulling apart, right? 68% versus 27%. So the universe is expanding and causing it to expand faster and faster as time goes on. A tug of war with the dark matter pulling the universe together. So how did Earth and our universe come to be? Science says that one possibility is this Big Bang. But do you know what? It's probably what we learned as kids in school is the Big Bang is, you know. But there are lots of other theories out there as well these different stories. Research is still being done and clues are still being discovered. And so 14 billion years ago, what they know, scientists seem to agree on, is that there was some kind of background radiation that is still detectable from that original whatever happened. During the first 400,000 years following that moment, the universe existed as a dense, hot, opaque plasma, particle soup of matter and energy. Tiny disturbances called quantum fluctuations set off sound waves like ripples from a pebble tossed into a pond. And that's what helped matter start clumping together. It's those little sound waves. And the result of the cooling and the clumping is that photons could escape. Photons. So that was the first light. So science, continuing to be curious, asking questions and exploring ideas. And so sometimes religion and those stories are at odds with science and these stories. But think back to dualism. What if 14 billion years ago, God decided to show himself in those quantum fluctuations? Can you hold two things at once, the religion and the science? Do you want to? Is it beneficial for you to get rid of either or and shift to both and in order to open more fully? And again, I put these questions out not because I'm pushing what I believe, but these are big questions to consider. What I do know and what I do believe is that bonding is at the heart of the cosmos. So gravity and dark matter, they are organizing forces. They are engendering relationships, creating these balanced relationships. The quarks and the leptons, all these little elementary particles started coming together. There's allurement in these opposites that gives birth to atoms. And so it's attraction what is bringing our universe together. <coughs> So then some star science, how did Earth come to be here? Again, the science part of this is that there was a supernova explosion, one of the most violent events to regularly occur in the universe. This star is a huge ball of hydrogen gas compressed by gravity, and it fuses into helium, which re releases an enormous amount of heat and light. So fusion reactor. So when a star is ending its life, all of this cosmic alchemy begins. Stars have this finite life and then they die and some kind of fizzle out and some with this huge bang where heavy elements are formed and released as gas clouds and then they condense with gravity to form solar systems. 
So it's as violent as the universe gets, right? This huge, a star is obliterated and then creates all this other stuff. Without these explosions, life would not exist. So I'd like you to, if I can get this to work, oh, I'll have to figure out how to get this to work another time. We will, oh, nope, okay. I'll get it for you next time. So thinking about the power of the universe, thinking about this epic kind of way that these stories come about and the way that they shape our lives, I'd like you to take in this story, the story of Sky Woman falling onto Turtle Island. In their beginning, there was the sky world. And a woman that inhabited that world slipped and fell into, or rather through, a hole. She fell like a maple seed pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear, or maybe in hope, you can see her there, she clutched that bundle. Hurtling downwards, she saw only dark water below, but in that emptiness there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. There they saw a small object, a mere dust mote in the beam. As it grew clear closer, they could see that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled toward them. The geese nodded at one another and rose from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather. gather. The loons, otters, swans, beavers, and fish of all kinds. A great turtle rested in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home, and they discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water, and they agreed to go find some. The loon dove first, but the distance was too far, and after a long while he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help, the otter and the beaver and the sturgeon, but the depth and the darkness and the pressures were just too much for even the strongest of the swimmers. They returned gasping for their air with their heads ringing, and some did not return at all. Soon, only a little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative, and eventually a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human, but then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched, and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, here, put it on my back and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks from the dub dab of mud on the turtle's back until the whole world was made not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all of the animal's gifts coupled with her deep gratitude. 
Together they formed what we know now today as Turtle Island, our home. Like any good guest, remember that Sky Woman had not come empty-handed. The bundle was still thinking, though, about what home means, right? In this story, they created home. So I started thinking about that, and I went and looked up the definition. A house, apartment, or other shelter that is the usual residence of a person, family, or household. Or the second definition, the place in which one's domestic affections are centered. That means the place where you keep your stuff. Okay. So I was really unsatisfied when I looked up this definition of home and it felt like there was so much missing. So I want to ask you, um, what is the connotation of the word home for you? I want to acknowledge that there are over 500 people in this room and home may not have been so great for some of you. And yet the idea of what home could be or should be is probably pretty deeply seated in each of us. So take a moment and, uh, and talk to your neighbor about this. What should a home offer? Then we'll get the microphones out. about I want to be in on your conversations what should a home offer I would love to get several people answering this what should a home offer we got one in the balcony Jen great thank you um, I said I'm Sydney by the way Hi, um, I'm up here I don't know if you can see me. I still can't find right Oh, there here. you are. Great. Thank you, Sid. Um, I said home is somewhere where I feel safe, loved, and at peace because people don't always do that. Yeah. Um, so it's just the environment, whether people are there or not. Mm -hmm. So, like, my mom is, like, my home. She just makes me feel loved, safe, and at peace. So when I'm around her, I always feel safe. But sometimes being alone makes me feel safe, too. Oh, lovely. I love all that. Thank you. Safe, love, and at peace. Okay. I have one There's down here one too. over here. Okay. Jen, on the balcony. Okay. The other one. Great. Good morning. Good morning. I think, like uh, as Thor said, Asgard is not a place; it's a people. And I think home is kind of like that. It's the people you surround yourself with. Ooh, sweet. Thank you. I have Jen. one here as well. Okay. Great. Go ahead. Um, so we, my partner and I, we both said like something similar to what they both said. Like it doesn't have to be a physical place. It could just be like a person or even just an object that makes you feel like at home. Like if you brought stuff like up here and you're not from here, like there's some objects or even pictures that can make you feel like at home, mm -hmm. even though it's, you're probably like hours away from your actual physical home. Right. Exactly. And so, what does that feeling bring up? Like what kind of 
like comfort and like security mm. and knowing that like you're loved and everything. Mm -hmm. Comfort, security, yeah, knowing you're loved. Sweet. Jen, we have someone back here. Okay, can you say where back here is? Oh, great, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Gigi, and kind of going along with like what everyone else said, I feel like a home isn't like the place you physically live in and like where all your stuff like is. Mm -hmm. It just should be a place where you feel comfortable and like you can be yourself and just you Ooh. feel secure there. Like yeah. my home is like the beach. Like I love the beach. Nice. So feeling secure. Thank you, Gigi. Um, feeling that it, it's more um, fe feeling like you can fully be yourself. That's very cool. I have one over here. Okay, can you, thank you. Hi, I'm Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Hi. I think with home comes a sense of familiarity. Mm. I think it's a place where you've spent a lot of time and it's a place that's kind of shaped your worldview and because of that, it's a place where you feel comfortable being. Mm, sweet, shaped your worldview, I like that phrase. That's interesting, cool. I have another one on the balcony to your left. Thank you. I think home is a place that you just can relax, be comfortable and stuff. Like even if it's not your own apartment, like my apartment is awful. So I <laughs> don't find that as like a home, yeah. but my friend's apartment, like I'm always there. I relax. It's a place I can calm down. So mm -hmm. I just think it's a comfort, a, like a level of comfort makes it a home. Oh, yeah. Nice. That being able to fully relax in, in yourself. That's cool. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? We have one more in the back of the front. Or Great. The Thank you. Yep. Hi. Uh, my name's Dylan. Hi, Dylan. Um, in my home, I feel like one of the most important things that I would need is like a very firm, rigid bed mm. with a nice, soft mattress. Okay. Because I feel like within a home, like the bed is arguably one of the most important parts mm -hmm. because it's where you go to sleep every night, it's where you wake up. And if you're not comfortable in your own bed, then how can you be comfortable in your own home? Yeah. Or and like, I feel like I could live anywhere, like I could live in a rock if I really wanted with a really comfy bed and I would enjoy it just as much. Yeah. So. Well, I think that what you're speaking to is our, our innate need for sleep, right? We, we need, as humans, need to sleep um, in order to feel fully ourselves. Yeah. When I don't sleep, I get really cranky. Me so. too. Totally. Absolutely. So thank you for speaking to that. Thank Thanks, you. Dylan. Yep. I have one over here. Great. Um, my name's Matthew, um, and I said home is a place where people realize when you're not there. Oh, and so what is that connection about the people that care whether you're there or not? Uh, like family, friends, when they realize that you're not there. Nice. Or they miss you, I guess. Yeah, that's sweet. So that human connection, I love that. Fantastic, thank you. Is there one back there too? Okay. We'll get one more, and then I have another question for you. Hi, I'm Hi. Ashley. Um, I kind of said that um, you can have a home pretty much wherever you go, and I say this in relation to the reflection from last week. Mm. Um, I said that I don't live in the universe, that the universe lives in me. Mm. So pretty much wherever I go, I see could be a potential home. Yeah, feeling at home within yourself. That's cool. So all these different connections that are made that, that help us to feel complete, that help us to feel whole. So then my next question is, what does a home require to offer those things? So for instance, if I am thinking about the structure in which I live and raise my family, um, I, I have to make sure that you know the water is running so that the toilets flush, so that the sinks work, so that there's a comfortable place to live. If we didn't have that, then, then it would be a struggle. It would be less home-like for me. So there's, you know, I have to put in stuff in order to get that home feeling out. So what is it that you, take another minute to talk to your neighbor about this, what does a home require in order to offer all those things that people just said?
what does a home require, whether you're thinking about home, you know, what, whatever version of home you are thinking about, what, what does that require? Uh, we have one up on the balcony to your left. Thank you. I don't think there's any set requirement. I feel like everybody has their own needs. That one person said that they just need a bed and they're fine. Mm -hmm. Like, for me, my requirement, like I have a good roommate, love my roommate, that's good. Um, but then like the apartment itself is falling apart at the seams. Mm -hmm. um, it's right outside construction. I can't sleep there or anything. So that's not like a home, but wherever like I go with my roommate, that's like a homey feeling. Yeah. So there is maintenance, you know, in order to make your apartment a place that would feel homey, there's just maintenance that needs to be done, right? And a lot of outside, inside, yes. Cool, thank you. We have another one up here, if that's okay. Sure. Hi, um, I think the smell of food, Ooh. the warmth is really important in the house. Mm -hmm. And I also think that um, the effort of the family members to get together to sit in a table and the result of the laughters together is really important. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. I have one over here. Okay. Hi, so me and my partner both agree that it's not like certain things that you need to make it a home, but it's more, it's like different for every person. For example, for a college student, it's more so like bringing the things you had when you were staying with your parents or whoever you were staying with to your dorm room, which gives you the feeling of like safety versus like someone who's probably like a billionaire or something, they would need more things for it to feel like home versus someone who's just poor, they might just need like a few dollars for food and they would be satisfied and they would feel at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so home can be so many different things. Interesting. Um, I also live with the dude who said we have a bad apartment, so here's my requirements. I just need a place where I can fall asleep on the couch that makes me feel comfortable and just be around like my family and stuff, but mm -hmm. yeah. All right, be around family, a comfy oh, yeah. Hi. Oh. Sorry, I'm Where? to your left, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I think to feel home, the first thing you need is yourself. Mm. Um, I, I said that um, to feel home is a choice you make uh -huh. because um, even though you're born into a family, you still have a choice whether you want that to be your home or not. So it's always a choice that you make, but you can't make it without yourself. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm right in the middle. Um, I agree with the last person. Like, I moved across the country to get away from home. Mm -hmm. um, so home is a place where I never felt respected. Yeah. And I'm about to graduate, and I'm a little bit afraid of going back home. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, like, home is a place where I can feel like I can be myself mm -hmm. and be respected. Yeah. Um, I was never emotionally safe at home, and so I think what you need to feel home is to feel grounded and that you can be yourself and be safe. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a thing that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a queer person. I think a lot of queer people can resonate with what I say with not feeling safe in the home, so mm -hmm. I, um, I found a home out here, but that home is, is slowly going away, so I'm trying yeah. to figure out like how I can feel that home more in myself before I return back to a place where I'm not respected. Yeah. Or if you have to. Yeah. I have one on the balcony to your right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I mentioned before about what home was to me. Yeah. Um, but I was going to say, I feel like home requires a sense of security, whether it's someone that's strong, um, a strong environment and like feeling safe, whether it's a toxic roommate, like your actual like environment or the structure of your apartment. Um, I feel like you can find strength in yourself or with others or just like in your environment mm -hmm. and the security of knowing that. Yeah, and so I was thinking about your example actually as I was, as I was phrasing this question and thinking about how you said your mom feels like home. And so what, you know, what, does she need in order to offer you that feeling of security, right? She probably needs to feel secure in herself. She needs to be comfortable with who she is. 
Um, she needs to have the resources that she's feeling healthy and, and good. You know, she has a mindset that is open to you. So thinking about how all of these different versions of what home and place are, whether it's a place or whether it's a feeling or whether it's um, a bed or whether it's, you know, an, a thing that you brought from where you used to live to where you are now. So home can be all of these different things, right? Um, so wrapping our head around that and then going back to the idea of the idea that that our planet is also our home. This is, we're gonna start here on Wednesday, but I just want to make this connection between the idea that home can be ourselves, home can be a structure, home can be people, home can be earth, home can be all of these different things. And the, the fact that, um, I'd like you to write this down in your journal. Right? I think this is a big part of this class. I'm sorry for those of you who are struggling over here to see. Um, what you choose to believe about your origin, about how you, very specifically you, got here, and your belief about your home, it profoundly affects your understanding of who you are and why you are here. So you may already have this vibe that Baisai opens you to some big questions. And I feel like this is one of the biggest that we're going to work with over the course of the semester. So thinking about the sky woman falling or thinking about whatever your creation story is, what, what would happen if we really honored those stories, right? What would happen if we knew as a deep belief in our core that there's this sacred responsibility that flows between us and Earth? Brian Swim says it this way. Whoops. He says it this way. Take hydrogen gas, leave it alone for 14 billion years, and it becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and Mozart's symphonies. Our stories are constantly shifting. And so with that in mind, here's your pack back question for this week. When do you feel at home and how do you nurture that relationship? Thanks for coming today. I hope that you have a beautiful day.